Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. After the transfiguration, as Jesus and the disciples were coming down the mountain, the disciples asked him, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He replied, Elijah is indeed coming and will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him, but they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that Jesus was speaking to them about John the Baptist. A gospel inspired by God. It seems that only two things are certain. Death and taxes. But there's a few exceptions. Not to taxes, but to death. Yeah. So in the Hebrew scriptures, there are two characters who never died. A character called Enoch and a character called Elijah. If you go through at the very, very beginning of the Hebrew scriptures, there's a list of the patriarchs and a list of how long they lived, how old they were when they gave birth to their kids, and how old they were when they died. And so it starts obviously with Adam. And it says, Adam lived to be 930 years, and then he died. His son Seth lived to be 912 years, and then he died. And the list goes on, you know, person by person by person, saying how long they lived and what age they were when they, were, they died. And so it says, for instance, Methuselah lived to be 969 years, and then he died. But there's one character right in the middle of the list called Enoch, and it says, Enoch lived to be 365 years, and then he walked with God. He's the only character in the list who didn't die. And when you look at his time span, all the rest live, the youngest is about 850 years, and the oldest is 969 years. They're all into the 800s and 900s, but Enoch is only 365 years of age, and then he walked with God. And the second character that didn't die is the character Elijah. You heard about him in the first reading and in the second reading. So let me give you a bit of the background to Elijah. Elijah flourished about 800 BC. And he was at a stage when the Israelites who had escaped out of Egypt in the year 1250 BC reached the Promised Land in the year 1210 BC and then spent the next 200 years trying to conquer it because it was, you know, occupied. There were lots of tribes living in this land. So they only conquered Jerusalem in the year 1010 BC. It took them 200 years to conquer it. But so for the next 200 years, they're ruled over by a series of judges and a few kings of various kinds. But in spite of the fact that it was supposed to be a land flowing with milk and honey, there were regular famines in the land. So at some stage, the people began to tire of this God called Yahweh. Now, the Israelites at this stage are not monotheistic. They're not monotheistic, in fact, for several hundred years after this. Moses was not a monotheist by any stretch of the imagination. He uh, promoted what's called monolatry. Monolatry is the worship of one God, but not the belief that there is only one God. There are lots of gods out there, uh, but you make a covenant with a particular God, and that's called monolatry. So in, in fact, the very first commandment that Moses handed on was, first, I am the Lord, your God. You're not allowed to worship other gods in front of me. He's not saying there aren't other gods. He's saying there's lots of gods out there, but I'm your guy. I'm making a contract with you, and you're not allowed to follow any other gods. So they believed in monolatry, but not, it wasn't monotheism by any stretch of the imagination. That would come several, 700 years later. So at the time of Elijah, you know, they're, uh, they're following a particular god, called Yahweh. But Yahweh had proved to be a really, really good war god, but pretty pathetic when it came to agriculture. So there's regular famines in the land. And so at this stage, people say, you know, maybe we need to kind of um, change allegiance at this stage. This guy brought us out of uh, Egypt, you know, he conquered the land for us, but for the last 200 years, it's been nothing but famines and shortages of various kinds. Maybe we need a different kind of a, a guide. And at this stage, the, uh, the king of Israel is a guy called Ahab, and his wife is Jezebel, who's a Philistine princess. And she's brought her own gods in there with her. Um, and so they begin to think, yeah, maybe we need to change allegiance to one of our gods. They seem to be good at pr providing rain. And so there's a big controversy. Are we going to stay with this guy Yahweh, or are we going to shift allegiance? 
And so along comes the prophet then, and he gives himself a nickname. The, the name Elijah is a nickname that he gave to himself. And in Hebrew, it is Eli Yahu, which literally means, Eli means my God, Yahu is Yahweh. My God is Yahweh. You guys can follow any God you want. I'm going to stick with Yahweh. And then there's this famous contest offering on the top of Mount Carmel where he challenges the prophets of Baal to a contest and he wins the contest and he has the whole 450 of them, their throats slit. He brings them down to the brook Jabbok and they cut off their heads. And so when Jezebel hears this, she's really upset. These are her prophets and she says, I, I guarantee by, may, may God do such and such to me if by this time tomorrow I don't have your head. And so Elijah flees goes off into the mountains, and he's complaining to God, they're all out to get me, and I didn't do nothing, you know, but they're trying to kill me. And so at one stage, then, Elijah is taken by the gods. So a fiery chariot comes along, and he's swept up into the heavens. So again, Elijah is the second character that never died. Now, there's a theory in ancient aliens that the gods that we were worshipping as gods were, in fact, were just advanced extraterrestrials with, with superior technology, and that Elijah was taken off in a spaceship, as was Enoch. That's a theory as well. But whatever, for whatever reason, none of these two characters died. But according to the Hebrew scriptures, before the Mashiach came back, before the Messiah returned, Elijah had to come to prepare the way for him. And so the preface to this story this morning is that there's an extraordinary scene on Mount Tabor. About a week before Jesus dies, there's the transfiguration. And in this deep, deep vision, he has a vision of Moses and Elijah appearing to him. And it's so powerful that the three disciples who are with him, Peter, James, and John, can also see these guys. Now, how they recognize them, I have no idea. Photography hadn't been invented. They weren't allowed to make any images in, in, in the Hebrew times. And so how they recognized it was Moses or Elijah, it beats me. But visions give you that kind of information, if, even if you don't have uh, previous information about them. So in any case, they're, he's speaking with Moses and Elijah. Now, they represent two parts of the Hebrew Scriptures. Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. The two great sections of the Hebrew Scriptures are the law and the prophets. There was a third section that came later called the writings, which were influenced by Zoroastrianism, and they came after the Babylonian exile. But the priestly caste of, of Judaism did not believe that the writings were canonical. They accepted only the law and the prophets. So here are the two representatives of the Hebrew Scriptures, Moses and Elijah, speaking to Jesus. And when the vision ended, and they're coming down the mountain, you, the, the passage picks up in it, and the disciples say to Jesus, why do the Scriptures say that Elijah has to come before the Messiah arrives? And Jesus' enigmatic response was, uh, the, the scriptures are right. Elijah does have to come back before the Messiah returns. But the truth is, Elijah has already come back, and they didn't recognize him, and they treated him any way they wanted. And then the very last statement today was, here the disciples realized that Jesus was talking about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is Elijah returned or come back to life. And so this obviously is some kind of a teaching about reincarnation. So did Jesus believe in reincarnation or did he even teach reincarnation? There are several passages in the New Testament where it's obvious that that was his mindset. So my favorite story is, it's in John's Gospel in chapter 9. And it's a story of a blind man, a guy who was born blind, and he sits outside the city of Jericho begging for alms. And he's a well-known feature. Everybody knows who this guy is. And Jesus and his disciples are coming out of the city one day, and one of the disciples looks at this uh, poor man begging, and he says to Jesus, you know, um, why was this man born blind? Was it because his parents were sinners, or was it because he was a sinner himself? Now, that question doesn't make any sense unless they were subscribing to reincarnation. How could somebody be born blind because of his own sin, unless there's a belief system that there was a previous lifetime in which he could have screwed up? And indeed, Judaism believed in reincarnation, and esoteric Judaism still believes in reincarnation. And in fact, the Christian church accepted reincarnation until the 553, the Second Council of uh, Constantinople, in which it was thrown out. But it was only thrown out parenthetically. It wasn't even debated. But the writings of one of the early church fathers, a guy called Origen, you know, they were thrown out in toto. All his books were thrown out in toto. He was anathematized. And he was a great proponent of reincarnation. So reincarnation just got kicked out, you know, by mistake. Like the baby went out with the bathwater. But it still remains in Catholic theology under the guise of purgatory, the notion of purgatory. Some place where there's an ongoing refinement that before enlightenment happens or before we get into heaven, there has to be some kind of a purification process. 
So in some senses, it's just a different form of you know, reincarnation. Reincarnation is the belief that we come back and we get purified in subsequent lifetimes on planet Earth in an incarnated form. And purgatory is the same version, except it's purification in a disincarnate form. So you get the teaching of reincarnation deeply embedded in the teachings of Jesus. All right, Bobby, what do you think? Okay. Okay. All the readings I've done are written out of the Bible. I've never picked that out. There you go. <laughs> it's impressive. Takes dentists a long time to think. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I didn't catch it all, but you're talking about the reincarnation, you're mm-hmm. talking about a purification process. Right. I didn't catch that purification. The purification, okay. And so the belief system uh, within kind of the reincarnational model, you know, and reincarnation is a belief system that you find in the ancient Celtic world. You find it in Buddhism, you find it in Hinduism. I found it with the people I worked with in East Africa for 14 years, the Kalenjin people, believed in reincarnation. So the majority of the world's population over the majority of human history have believed in reincarnation, that we just don't get one shot at life. We get as many opportunities as we need. And so the notion is that the process of enlightenment, souls volunteer for reincarnation in order to test themselves in limited circumstances as to whether or not they can love unconditionally anywhere. A soul is a bite-sized piece of God. It's pure love. But when it limits itself in a spacesuit in which you're operating with a little laptop that you carry between your ears, you have to trade cosmic consciousness for a tiny little brain. You have to tra- uh, trade a, a cosmic a eternal existence for a lifespan. You have to cram you know, cosmic you know, spaciousness into a little tiny little space of 150, 160 pounds. And there's amnesia created for you, in you, for who you really are, why you came, and what your purpose is. And so the question is, with those kinds of limited circumstances, can you learn how to love anyway? And so it takes us many, many iterations and many different kinds of configurations. So if you were a CEO in Silicon Valley, you know what, and you were a billionaire, could you be a loving person? If you were a slave girl in East Africa in the 1300s, could you love anyway? You know, if you were, you know, um, a politician in, a, in Turkey in the 19th century, could you love anyway? And so we get as many opportunities as we need until we can learn to love in all circumstances. And then, in some senses, the soul has graduated. Now, that's the kind of the reincarnational theory in uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, etc. In Catholic theology, there was a belief system that there's only one life. We only get one shot at it. But subsequently, we either get a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or a uh, let's wait and see. And so the thumbs up is you get straight to heaven. The thumbs down is you're not going to make it ever. And so you're going to get down you know, to Lucifer with his pitchfork. And the other one is, you know, you're not bad enough to get down there, but you're not good enough to get up there. So you're going to get purified in some kind of fire. You know, and there's graphic images of what that looks like. Uh, but the idea is that there has to be some kind of a purification before you're fit for you know, the, the presence of God. So it's just a thinly disguised form of reincarnation, except you're doing it in a disincarnate form. But there's a purification process that has to happen before enlightenment can occur. Yeah. Bob? Well, this is not original, but I've heard it said, so I never really liked it. Uh, I don't know if there's incarnation or not, but I really hope it's not, because I'll never have it this good again. <laughs> So there was f- there were actually four places. There was heaven, there was hell, there was purgatory, and there was limbo. Limbo was a place of whatever it looks like, natural happiness, where babies who were unbaptized, they hadn't committed any sins themselves, but they had original sin on their souls, so they couldn't get to heaven, but they didn't weren't going to heaven, uh, going to hell, and they couldn't purify themselves, and so there was a special holding pen, you know, where you know, angels came down and changed their diapers, you know, and fed them three times a day, but they never got to be in the presence of God. So that was very quietly closed down about 10 or 15 years ago, without any fanfare whatsoever. But purgatory is still alive and kicking in Catholic theology. And as far as reincarnation, another joke for you. A guy told me one time, he says, I don't believe in reincarnation. And I didn't believe it in my last lifetime either. Yeah. Well, that limbo, I think, is one of the worst teachings. 
oh. that the church ever, ever oh, had. I rushed to get my children That's baptized crazy. within the first yeah. two weeks of their life. I was so afraid that something would happen to them and that they would never get to heaven. So I, you know, I, you know, I was taking these newborns into the church for baptism. It was, uh, it I believed all these things very, yeah. very uh, It was strange. even worse than that, Connie. There was a practice, Irish nurses were trained, if, if it was a very difficult delivery and there was an opportunity, a chance that the child might die in transit, they would baptize them with turkey basters in utero before they were born. They really serious, to make sure that if they died before they actually got out and couldn't be baptized afterwards, they got baptized in utero. And that's how crazy the thinking was. Because it was a good way for the church to sell indulgences. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it's very interesting that if you if you let go of, you know, if you subscribe to a theory of reincarnation, three things happen immediately. The first thing, it is very difficult con to control a population who realizes they have as many chances as they can to come back and, you know, and learn to love. If you tell people, you convince people, there's only one lifetime, and we, the church, will tell you whether you're going to get a thumbs up or a thumbs down, you have total control over a population. So it's a control mechanism, firstly. Secondly, reincarnation allows you to realize that all prejudices are ridiculous because you either have been or will be in all of the positions against which you are now prejudiced in a particular lifetime. If you're prejudiced, for instance, on uh, racial bounds or uh, gender issues or socioeconomic status, whatever, you've been in all the other configurations or will be in all of the other configurations. So it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to be prejudiced. And the third thing is you become very ecologically aware. It, there's no point in trashing a planet if you're going to inherit it yourself. You can trash the planet if you know two or three generations down the line are going to inherit the mess that you made. But you're out of it at that stage, so what do you care? But what do you care if you're going to come back? You're the guy who's inheriting that. So theologically for me, sociologically for me, psychologically for me, it makes perfect sense that you know, God or Source gives us as many opportunities as we need to learn how to love unconditionally, to learn ourselves, to love ourselves, to love each other, and to love our home. So is there anything in the Jewish tradition that looks like purgatory, or was this something, is this just something... In esoteric happened? Judaism, there's a belief system in reincarnation. So in that sense, there is this purification process. But uh, strictly speaking, in kind of normative Judaism, there's no, there is no such thing as... No, no I know, because my, my animals were like that. But do they... Um, so this was really something manufactured in the church in some council mm -hmm. somewhere. Right. So okay. once, you start, once you start dealing with the notion of sin, and then you start fine-tuning what sin looks like, there's mortal sin, who's going to send you straight down, and then there's venial sin, which didn't really upset God that much, but he's displeased with you, so he's not going to let you into the party, you know, until you kind of get your act together, and so they have to now start creating all these kind of artificial uh, categories and holding pens. So it's, I mean, it's total theological mishugas. It's the same kind of mindset that gave us how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. And this was one of the, and it's, this is a recurring theme in religion. This was one of the big beefs that the Buddha had with the Hinduism in which he was raised. He was raised a Hindu. And uh, at the time of the Buddha, Hinduism had gone off into all this kind of speculative theological thinking. And the Buddha he said, you know, this kind of speculation is totally useless. What we know is our experiences now, and what we know is that the way to, 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 be, to be totally free is to get control over your, over your mind and your consciousness. What comes afterwards, we can't say, according to the Buddha. And all these kinds of, uh, this kind of mishugas about this kind of puja will get you that, and this kind of puja will get the other. So he was totally against this kind of speculative thinking. Yeah. It's just a natural progression that they start to yeah. off the Once you start fine-tuning, once you create a theological class, a theologian class, whose job it is to speculate about the unthinkable, they're going to create all these kinds of uh, theories, none of which can be proven, and th th they will be exercised by an institution to maintain some kind of control over a population. So they're working hand-in-hand hand then, yeah, the thinkers and the, insta the, and the uh, oligarchy. Where did this concept of original sin come from? Okay. Yeah. 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 This is a courtesy of, uh, of um, Augustine, who flourished around the year 400. Now, Augustine was, was raised a pagan, and he was a very le uh, led a really kind of a, a profligate lifestyle, had a child out of wedlock, in fact. And then his mother, uh, Monica, finally managed to convert him. And so his great prayer was, he would pray finally, uh, give me chastity. 
but not yet. And then finally, he totally converted, became the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa, in Car near Carthage. And then, like, all, like many, many converts, become a dyed-in-the-wool kind of Christian. It was, he invented the, the concept, and it went like this. Augustine lived at a time when the Roman Empire was under assault by the Germanic tribes, who were kind of these ruthless, irrational, you know, warrior caste, while Rome was built upon logic and reason and straight thinking. So Augustine was of the opinion that we most resemble God in our ability to think rationally and to think logically. So when you're rational and logical, you're most in God's image and likeness. When you're irrational, you're most ungodly. And he came to the conclusion that people are most irrational uh, when they're having sex at the moment of orgasm. You're totally out of control, totally irrational, and it's at that stage that the baby gets conceived. So the baby gets conceived at the moment when we're most ungodly. That was his thinking. So we're born, every child is conceived with the stain of original sin because the parents conceive them at the time when they're mostly, most ungodly. And so that had to be dealt with in some way. Now, this has almost nothing to do with, we think the original sin was Adam and Eve, that Judaism has no idea of an original sin. There was a first sin, but it's not an original sin in the sense that it gets passed on to everybody else in their essence. You know, so Augustine was the, uh, was the genius who created that. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Okay. <laughs> okay. The Gnostic Gospels, when they had the um, Greek philosophers, mm -hmm. were very much in favor of reincarnation. Yes. Of course, all Absolutely. that was thrown out. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally. The Gnostics and before that, uh, Socrates and Plato. Plato was a big, big, big advocate of reincarnation. Yeah. And I mean, it doesn't, for, in a modern scientific understanding, you know, according to uh, science, you know, there's a, a law called the conservation of energy. You can neither create nor destroy energy. You know, you can't destroy matter. Matter exists in one of four forms. It exists as a solid, a liquid, a gas, or a plasma. And all you can do is change it from one state to the other. So there's conservation of energy and momentum, you know, in, within scientific models that you literally can't destroy stuff. You can just change its state or reconfigure its components. And so if that's true of something physical, like, you know, matter or energy, how much more true is it of our essence, our core being? It cannot be destroyed. It can be reconfigured, but it can't be destroyed. It's just so unfair that we come back not knowing any of this history so that we can yeah. learn on it, you know? What well, it's interesting that um, there's two ways of accessing previous experiences. One is that they can be hardwired into the system, into the personality, and the other one is that we can have conscious recall over it. So if you think, for instance, Connie, about the first two years of your life in this incarnation, you probably can't remember a single incident. But there were hugely formative years in your life a lot of your personality was put in place in those two, two years. So a lot of who you are happened at a time that over which you have no conscious recall. So in that sense that all of our previous lifetimes are uh, embedded and kind of encoded, you know, in the personality that we come in with as little children. Uh, now we build upon that. So whether or not we have conscious recall over it or not, it's guiding who we are. Now, there's, there, is, there are advantages in recalling some stuff, and there are disadvantages in recalling. Because if all of us had access to all of the previous lifetimes we've lived, we've been mass murderers. You know, we've been despicable characters in previous incarnations when the soul was very early in his trajectory in learning how to love. Now, if we could remember all of that, we would be so overburdened with guilt that we'd be totally incapable of even moving. So there's a reason why there's some kind of amnesia. But sometimes we can recall and we can get access occasionally to some past life memories and then it can be helpful to identify themes that we're working on in this present incarnation. Yeah. We had, a, we had an experience when uh, Ed had, was diagnosed with cancer and okay. we were seeing this. Uh, we, we were talking <coughs> all sorts of different things and we, we met this uh, Chinese doctor mm -hmm. um, Dr. Shaw is his name, and he had some very interesting abilities. Um, wow. yeah, you know, from Qigong and all sorts oh, of other things. So, okay. anyway, um, on this one occasion, he said that he would do a karmic cleansing right. on Ed. Right. And this was a uh, this was quite strange. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to a park nearby, Golden Gate Park. Golden Gate okay. Park. Actually, the, the first day we met him, it turned out. 
his office was next to a store that had owned in San Francisco. A strange coincidence for right. us. And anyway, he said, I'll do this cleansing, but we'll have to go outdoors because it's very powerful. So there were, we were standing there in the park and there was a, a two, two or three people uh, around us and he kind of, just kind of looked at Ed. He wasn't even touching him. And he said some things and Ed just fell over backwards right. like this, right. you know? I mean, it right. was it was very strange. It was, he went, you know, yeah. and we were quite shocked at, at this because it's not the kind of person who, you yeah. know, is susceptible to yes. or is with imagination or yeah. anything. But this was a physical reaction. So we said to Dr. Shaw, "Okay, so what does this mean? What mm -hmm. did you? What yeah. is this karma?" He said, "Well, I don't have time to explain this to you now, but there is a Catholic nun who has the ability to see into the psychic record." Yeah, the records. The, the, what they call Akashic, Akashic records, Akashic records. Mm -hmm. and uh, she lives near you, and you can go and, and visit her, mm -hmm. and she will do a reading for mm -hmm. you. I said, but she's not even here. He said, it doesn't matter. She doesn't have to be here. So uh, we contacted this nun who is still was still a nun in the mm -hmm. Catholic Church, uh, but living in a little house with a roommate in Redwood City. Mm -hmm. And we made an appointment to go and see her, and we didn't know what to give her, so we brought a big basket of fruit. It was in August, you know, and uh, so she sat us down, and we talked a little bit. She said, well, what do you want to know? And um, we said, well, we'd like to know what this karma is, and also, you know, how we got together in this lifetime, because we've had several of these big experiences, you know, and so what does it all mean? So she said, okay, and she went and got her tape recorder and came out, and uh, she said, uh, don't talk while this is on, she said, because uh, I, I won't know. She said, I record it because I won't know what I said. And so uh, she, she's put the tape recorder on and kind of sat there for just a few minutes and went into a trance and told it is karma and told me my karma. And yeah, and it was, <laughs> it was awesome. rather quite awesome. Awesome, that's brilliant. So Ed said, his karma cleansed, and I'm, he's good. He's good, to, <laughs> good go. to know. You're good for another 100,000 miles, Ed. <laughs> he's done bad in between. Since then, you know, he kind of screwed up again. But <laughs> that's brilliant. That's brilliant. That's awesome. Interesting experience. Yeah, totally. We're all connected. And all, I, I think that the, uh, that the universe is like a, a, a kind of a doting grandmother who videotapes everything all her grandkids are doing. And that's what the Akashic Records are. You know, she's so happy f for us that, you know, and she wants to show us photographs. You want to go back and check the photographs, they're all there. It's only a question of learning to know how to access that information. It's all there. No, nothing gets destroyed. Yes. Yeah. It's worse than the NSA. <laughs> 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 I need to go to work, guys. I stand up for it.